three, two, one. Now here's Not something we hope radio. you'll really like. But there is one voice that has never been heard before. The voice of old Mr. World himself. The way he might sound if he could speak to us in our own language. Mr. World, how was this wonderful orderly earth of ours formed in the first place? And how long has it been going on? Well, if a few people do decide to swing one way or another, it might actually pass. Uh, this property was used to grow with manufacturing marijuana. And the judge said he needed a timeout, so he took his belt and his shoes and his tie and put him in a locker. We're traveling through a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a wireless transmitter. Measure time and light. Astonishing, perhaps, but you can find it in a place that's known as... Planet Green Trees! Attention, ladies and gentlemen, the Planet Green Trees show is underway with your host, attorney Michael Camor. All righty. Dewey, stay by. We have launched. Dewey, stay close. Welcome, everybody. We have begun the show. You are officially listening to Planet Green Trees, episode number 315. We're calling it Happiness is a Warm Gun. And despite the fact that we've begun the show, you'd think people in the studio would stop talking and somewhat pay attention. But no. No, that is not happening. Like as if it's a comedy No attention paid. But moving on beyond that part of the humor that we're going to be indulging upon uh, tonight, amongst other things, uh, I want to welcome everybody officially. As I said, 315 episodes. Happiness is a warm gun. We're calling it. We'll explain that later. But this is Planet Green Trees. I'm your host, Michael Kamorn, and we're about to embark on two hours of nothing but most up-to-date, informative, and educational things about medical marijuana, cannabis, cannabis reform in uh, Michigan. And... Uh, Alongside me to help me uh, present this, I'd like to call the community entertainment. Please welcome, if you would, our technical director, Chad from the Bermuda Confession Club. Good evening. It's nice to be here. Our producer. The one and only Chad. Nice to be here. Was it like a, like a third-person description of himself? Or what, seriously. All right. Rick Thompson is uh, not here. We know that he will be calling in. And uh, we'll be doing the news tonight. We'll be doing the news Top tonight. Top of the second hour. Couldn't hear you. Top of the second hour. We will get a little uh, call from before that. Also here, uh, as he is pretty much every week, our producer Jamie Lowell of Third Coast Compassion Club. Th- welcome, Jamie. Chad, you can turn the mic on. Sure. Hello, now can I be heard? Hello, and don't forget to check out Planet Green Trees, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association and Camoran Law on Instagram, Twitter, and Mass Roots. Excellent. Also here is the one and only founder of Michigan Parents for Compassion. First, I'd like to call my friend. It's also Reggie. Please welcome Jim Powers. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here after uh, another killer week. Glad everyone survived the cup. Jamie's still looking a little bit, a uh, little bit iffy, but I think we'll get through it. Jamie looks kind of like the Clash. <laughs> we also have sitting right across from here my good friend and uh, compatriot. In the war that we uh, wage are waged in, not wagers, but involved in. My friend uh, Dewey, welcome, Dewey. Okay, Hello, everyone. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Not in the studio right now, but uh, close by. So I'm a little while by a good friend and also compatriot attorney and a guitar player, attorney extraordinaire Jeff Frazier is in the area. Also uh, in our crew is not here today, Eric Gunnell, Theo Gantos. We, Dewey is here, as I said. I want to give a shout-out to Pam. Bob Redden, Carrie, Knucklehead Bob, David Light, Jeremy Golson, David Rodoy is not here. Josie Scoggins, T-Pain is a rover not here either. 
Um, tonight's show is very exciting. We've got a lot of things to talk about, and because of the uh, tightness of our show, we probably won't be able to explore it all. Just kidding. Um, but we're going to add some stuff to these topics here. But as many of you know, the MI legalized uh, ridiculous governmental uh, intrusion and failure to follow the laws resulted in a court of claims challenge and now a bad decision, which is going to the Michigan Supreme Court. And what is exactly is next for MI legalized? We're going to have attorney David Cahill, who is the attorney that wrote the brief, I believe, right? No, he was involved. Involved in it. He's his advisor, advising yeah. on it. Yeah, but uh, seasoned in election law, he is steeped in it. Steeped in it. And uh, what was that? What is the strategy going for for my legalize? We're gonna have a recap of the county fair, Michigan High Times Cannabis Cup award winner Captain Kirk is gonna be calling it, right? He will be. Okay. And everything else that is related to medical cannabis and cannabis reform in Michigan is what we're gonna be talking about. Maybe maybe there was a there was additional stuff. Yeah, that's the, that's the structure. I didn't go by your thing. I, I made my own because you were late, and I set it up. It was different. Okay. I mean, no, I just didn't. It was maybe not late. All right, I'm sorry. All right, so um, in a minute or so, we're going to be going to a break, and when we come back, our plan of attack is going to be uh, we have David Cahill calling in at 8.30? Yeah, yes. And Rick is going to be doing the news at uh, 9.00. And I'm going to rant so when we come back after the break. And uh, Jamie's going to sing. Sing, right, sir? We'll be right back. It was Planet Creatures. The Planet Green Trees Show. Join the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association today, michiganmedicalmarijuana.org. The MMMA is focused on the well-being and safety of medical marijuana patients. The MMMA site provides the most comprehensive and up-to-date news on legal issues, politics, research, cultivation, as well as the various strange products and methods of cannabis use. Come join the discussion with the most knowledgeable and passionate advocates in Michigan today, michiganmedicalmarijuana.org. If you missed the last Full Melt show, you missed a lot. King Tut. There's King Tut. You know what I wanted to bring up King Tut? But they actually dug up in Russia a, uh, some ancient bongs. They're like 2,400 years old. Yes, that's fucking awesome. They're golden. Oh, my God. Two ancient golden bongs yeah. found in the Arctic tundra of Russia. They were getting high, man. Yeah. And 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 I guess they traced it back to the uh, early tribes that populated, you know, the Russian tundra. Those tribes used to war against each other, and they would get high on the opium and the cannabis before going to war. Go for it. I'm just saying, there's somebody was selling golden bongs. I don't know. Get your golden bongs here. Golden bongs. It had to be really hard back in those days to come up with gold. <laughs> Except for maybe Colombian gold. Oh, my God. Hey, the trade winds are blowing smoke in your face. Fantastic guest bloggers, incredible photography, and cutting-edge information separates the Compassion Chronicles from all other websites. Sign up for your newsletter today. Since 2012, the Compassion Chronicles has been delivering news and information for Michigan's patient community and beyond. From breaking news to science articles to networking and event information, Michigan turns to the Compassion Chronicles when patients and caregivers need to know the score. Edited by Rick Thompson, winner of the Crystal Trichrome Award for Journalist of the Year and named Citizen Activist of the Year 2015 by The Weed Blog. TheCompassionChronicles.com. And now back to more Planet Green Trees. Alrighty, we're back. Thanks for staying with us. You're listening to Planet Green Trees, officially episode number one. Three fifteen. Okay, so now this is my slot for the rant, which I get about fifteen twenty minutes, and uh, then we're gonna. I don't know. Figure out when we get there. So uh, there's a number of things that have happened uh, this week in, in in the news, also in courts, um, but I want to talk in a general sense of uh, this question that I was asked to answer which is it's a good question and a lot of people that don't really fully understand it a lot of people that know and understand what's happening in the Michigan medical marijuana may, may see or understand why this is a 
Interesting question. But um, first, let me say uh, some news items that I want to cover at some point in time, amongst others that we're going to talk about, is that there was a Ninth Circuit case upholding the right of gun, gun stores to not sell guns to the medical marijuana patients. Gun advocate, Second Amendment advocate Jeff Frazier is here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> He'll be discussing this, amongst other things. And I know that uh, we put a lot of calls out for the NRA. The uh, president, Jamie, tried to call me. They would not come on. And I'm sure they will be protesting this and speaking ill of that. Uh, those justices that uh, came to that conclusion. Um, I thought that was important in the news. The other thing is, uh, as we found and have had guests on that to test to these artifacts or evidence that I would call, um, there was a recent study, and, and I have it right here. Jamie, maybe you'll help me, but it was it was related to a uh, those those cities that uh, those those states that had legalization or medical marijuana found that their employees had better work better. attendance, better work attendance, better which is more likely to mean better performance at work. And we've seen a number of these different Just things. generally better people. seen a number of different things in this regard regarding fewer overdoses in, in, in states that have legalization or some kind of medical marijuana reform. Um, and also this recent study we had the guests on where Medicare payments for prescription opiates was substantially reduced for those states that were using medical marijuana. So there's significantly less prescriptions being written by doctors for those things. Absolutely. And I think that those are, you know, it's, and, and, and as these states begin to be able to collect data, I think it becomes important to uh, hear these things and see how they are unequivocally making a, a positive impact socially in, in, in that area of that, that's being targeted. Um, important things to think about. Also, also, um, you know, we, the, so, so I want to talk about this question that uh, was posed. We were trying to answer it, and, you know, and, and it really cuts to the heart of the matter. Jeff, jump in whenever I, I get off track here. But uh, we, we've talked about this in the past, and I think, you know, the concept is, like, you know, how or when did the police become the designated individuals who would manage the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act? I mean, theoretically, there's no designation of authority that exists. It doesn't say the Michigan State Police shall do this. Yes, it is it is um, it is, what do you call it? Regulated, the, the police regulate the public health code, but there's no designation or declaration. It's going to self proclaim. We are going to oversee these things. When arguably the Department of Community Health was the designated agency that was supposed to oversee the formation of it. And what, what the question that came about is, you know, why is it that patients or caregivers aren't charged with violations of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act? Why is the default charge or action that is taken amongst patients or caregivers when they find themselves out of strict, unambiguous compliance with Section 4? Why is the automatic go-to next action a police arrest or charging through the prosecutor's office for public health code violations, specifically felonies, manufacturing marijuana illegally, the possession of marijuana with intent to deliver, and the delivery of marijuana when, in fact, those are the exact things that a patient or caregiver is entitled to do, authorized to do by the state under the definition of medical use. So you have this authorization of these, of these individuals to engage in all of these things, the delivery of marijuana, the transportation of marijuana, the possession, the ingestion, manufacturing. This is what the state entitles you to do. And by definition, doesn't even have any limitations on it, but yet the law enforcement community calls out and decides that it is instead behavior that is associated with the public health code. And, 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 and then why is it? What's the, what's the connection? Well, you know, there's a lot. The, the simple legal answer, I think, is that there is no official charges within the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act officially there's one or two that provide a penalty for somebody, a person, patient, who is outside of that compliance. There's no, like, default penalty section that's specific in regards to those violations. You know, because from the outside, someone would ask the question, well, if, if they have 13 plants and allowed 12 or their door's unlocked and, 
you know, it's a technical violation. Why is it that they get a, you know, seven-year felony, 20 plants to 200 manufacturing? Why is it? Well, it's because somebody decided to do it. I mean, let's not, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't, like, naturally gr- develop into that. Somebody has to do something. they got to write a report. they got to request a warrant. And, of course, law enforcement does that, and the prosecutor's office signs off on it, and then charges get issued through the judicial system. So it's something that take, takes place like any other charges, but it is initiated and sought by the investigating officers and nobody else. So let's not kid ourselves in terms of how this goes about. And ironically, the same individuals, the self-anointed individuals who are going to manage and oversee the Michigan Medical Marijuana are the same individuals that generate these particular investigations and the and these are the exact individuals that seek out the charges that they're going to call felonies as opposed to what would be deemed as medical use. Now we know how it works in the law if you're outside of you know the, the, the interpretation has been marijuana is still illegal, medical marijuana is still legal, it didn't legalize it few of the opinions say or allude to and although other opinions arguably say you have a right patients have a right to engage in the medical use that's not really like it's still illegal this is a competing you know idea and interpretation how can it be illegal per se except if you're in compliance with it if at the same time a patient by definition has a legal right to acquire it and engage in medical and, and by having a card it is presumptive that they are engaging in the medical use. You can't reconcile those those two positions, but yet still the law enforcement interpretation, marijuana, medical marijuana is still legal, and only if you are in absolute strict compliance, defined by them under their scrutiny and with all of their abilities to you know, know nothing about anything, not even fully understand the law, and mistakenly call something out as being not in compliance and take property take your plants, take your belongings, and seek charges, which is the way that it goes down. But let's, let's talk about this because there is no availability. Like, for example, if someone has 13 plants when they're only allowed to have 12, you can't, there's no, there's no re- penalty that says it's a one-year misdemeanor civil infraction r- resulting in a fine. There is a prohibition oftentimes overlooked in 7D, which is if an individual is fraudulently representation makes fraudulent representations to a law enforcement official of any fact or circumstances related to medical use of marijuana, to avoid arrest is punishable by a fine, which is in addition to any other penalties that they may be arrested for. So this is what usually happens. This would be a piler on type of offense where they've already got you in the public health code, and if they want to, they can charge you with this additional civil infraction. Of course, there's another one in four was a four K that that defines. Uh, uh, two-year misdemeanor, two-year felony, I should say, that um, if a patient is or caregiver is engaging in activity outside the limitations of Section 4, um, if they are specifically selling to somebody that is not allowed to use marijuana for purposes under the Act, and et cetera, that's a uh, two-year fine and or uh, two years maximum fine, not more than $2,000. All right, so, but the problem is that there is no there's no in between. That's it. How do we get here? Is this what was intended? You know, I, we had a case. I like to talk about it because it's always good when justice goes your way. But uh, Jennifer Hensey, case that got a lot of attention for a lot of different reasons, oftentimes overlooked. Her case was dismissed at the district court level by Judge Nicholson. Is that right? Is Judge Chad Nicholson, yes. who was a retired judge, came back and had been the chief judge of the court, but retired and came back and was sitting. Was lucky enough to. You know, have our case and four days of testimony. I think he, you know, he was not happy about any of that. But at the end of the day, he made a finding that I've not heard ever made of any other judge anywhere, and it made a lot of sense. And the allegations, the fact finding that he had made in this evident in the preliminary exam, even though we disagree with it, was, you know, the alleged accused went to a location dispensary with the intention of. Trading, trading, taking three ounces or six ounces, whatever it was, and giving it to another caregiver in exchange for the exact same amount, exact same amount. No money was exchanged. No one left weighing more than they did when they came in. Now, one thing, it's arguably, it meets the definition of what I call fungible. 
fungible. There's no it's equated to the same. And the judge made that fact finding. We disputed it, but nonetheless, he then went and said this. Even though this may be a technical violation of Section 4, it is de minimis. de minimis. And de minimis means that it is not worthy of prosecution. It's that in between that is offered, overlooked. When I first heard it, I was like, what is he doing? They're going to appeal it. This is not a thing. He's throwing some stuff out there that's going to be. But then I realized afterwards what a genius it was. Because it really is that. If you're going to call it something, what is it? It's, it's really the point of discretion of law enforcement. It's the point of w how are we going to deal with this? And one might say, yes, but there's a checks and balance in the system because they don't issue the charges. But if you are awesome and most of the prosecutors are getting paid to defend the police and capitulate to their clients, that's what they call them in forfeiture. Do you know that? When the pro they call them their client, we have to call my clients and see if they want to give you back your, you know, your mandolin from 1920 that your family, you know, that. So it's, so th this is this is the, the the concept of what's going. On. I'm still putting it back. You know, I was going to prom promise all this was I was going to try not to, in my rant, say that the police are awesome because that's where I always seem to end up, and that this is this is really all about the amount of business that's generated by the illegality associated with uh, marijuana and medical marijuana. But this is something to consider as well, because I, 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 there is this uh, clear designation, and there's an area in the law which, again, is overlooked. And let me just remind people, because it's such a well-written portion. First of all, in the findings and declarations section of the MMA, Section 2, I would argue if we, if we did a search of Section 2 and findings and declaration of all the medical marijuana cases, there would not be one reference to this section, Right? There's not one, you know, if you look at any, they never refer to, why not? The first thing should be that modern medical research, including found by the National Academy of Science Institute of a 1990 report, has discovered the beneficial use of marijuana in treating or alleviating pain and nausea. What they're saying is that marijuana has medical benefits. Bam! It is no longer Schedule 1. Bam! The voters shut it down. No one ever talks about that. That's really what this is. This is a declaration of the voters of the state of Michigan. It is not yet treated otherwise, and especially by law enforcement. How do we get there? How does the discretion go there when the voters are saying this shall not be treated like it has been in the past under any circumstances? And we're not going to get into an equal protection, we were talking about that before, of how it is only that for some and not everybody. The declaration is that this plant has medical benefits, period. Further. The declarations go on that data from the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Uniform Crime Report and Compendium of Federal Justice Statistics show that approximately 99 out of every 100 marijuana arrests in the United States are made under state law rather than under federal law. Consequently, the voter state changing state law will have the practical effect of protecting, of protecting from arrest the vast majority of seriously ill people who have a medical need to use marijuana. Not not a dying need, a medical need to use marijuana. That is what the preamble says. And I'm going to finish that though when we come back because I'm going on all night about this. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more Planet Green Trees. In 1973, under President Nixon, the federal government set up five drug classifications based on risk, Schedule 1 being the most dangerous. What is considered a Schedule 1 drug? Marijuana, LSD, and heroin. What is a Schedule 2 drug? Cocaine. What is a Schedule 3 drug? Anabolic steroids. What is a Schedule 4 drug? Valium. Schedule 5 drugs are considered the least risky. What is considered the least risky drug? Cough preparations with less than 200 milligrams of codeine. And what drugs are not scheduled at all? Alcohol and cigarettes. Why does the federal government consider tobacco and alcohol a low risk and marijuana a high risk? If you answered, I don't know, you answered right. We don't know either. End prohibition now. 
Join the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association today, michiganmedicalmarijuana.org. The MMMA is focused on the well-being and safety of medical marijuana patients. The MMMA site provides the most comprehensive and up-to-date news on legal issues, politics, research, cultivation, as well as the various strange products and methods of cannabis use. Come join the discussion with the most knowledgeable and passionate advocates in Michigan today. MichiganMedicalMarijuana.org Georgia Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Introducing Sacred Elements, a place for natural and alternative healing for the mind, body, and soul. Sacred Elements. It's one place, all solutions. Alkaline water, herbal remedy, essential oil. Sacred Elements. Natural and organic shampoo, lotion, pain cream, bath salt. Sacred Elements. Beeswax candles and handmade crafts, canes and walking sticks, artwork, jewelry, and repurposed goods. Sacred Elements. Next to this wheat leaf, 400 South Door Highway, Flint. 11 to 7 daily Sunday. Call 810-259-2570. Ram trucks are reaching new heights when it comes to capability and efficiency. The Ram Heavy Duty is the most capable full-size pickup on the road today. And the Ram 1500 is the most fuel-efficient full-size pickup ever. So what does that mean? It means Ram trucks are built for the long haul. Ram. America's longest lasting pickups. You are the first participant on the call. Please hold back to Planet Green Trees. Dead air, Chad. Dead air. All right, so we're back. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, Episode whatever, and that's what we're talking. J- J- Jeff Frazier wanted to jump in. I was finishing my rant there about why things are all messed up, and how is it that technical violations result in, in felony charges? Part of it is because there's no penalties within the act and de minimis. But Jeff Frazier, jump and tell me. I'll just say real quick that it seems like very early on, the the problem is that they got probable co- probable cause wrong. Um, and because here's the deal, immunity from arrest only means anything on the street level. You know, it only means anything when you're having an interaction with a police officer. By the time you're arrested and you're thrown in jail and your stuff's been taken, you've been raided, and now you're at a probable cause hearing, you know, arguing that, number one, you shouldn't have been arrested, and number two, there's not probable cause for the bind over. So I think it... When, when, they, when they cheated on probable cause early on, probable cause to arrest, that's what it all flew, flew you know, kind of evolved from. Well, this is a perfect time to get our next guest on the phone. David Cahill is uh, in the queue. And who's going to take care of the gym? Are you doing that? David, uh, Attorney David Cahill, is, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have him call in to Planet Green Trees. Can you hear us, David? Hello, Mike. Oh, fantastic. It's working. We're, I'm always amazed oh, yes, when the it's working. This technology. You know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm glad you're calling in. Our topic that we are going to uh, have you indulge us in is the, you know, what's next for Am I Legalized? But I don't know if you heard the topic. This is just what we were kind of leaving off on. And you're a longtime champion of reform for marijuana, and I know you've been around in the Ann Arbor area and probably had something to do with some of the, you know, decriminalization and the sanity in Ann Arbor. But all the local, um, of course, initiatives... We're talking about the MMMA and the idea that the default action when someone is slightly out of a compliance with Section 4 or, you know, a technical violation is a violation of the public health code. That's right. And that there's no other penalties that find themselves within the MMA that would be the next, you know, somewhere in between, less penalized. You know, putting aside the idea that the police are the ones that get to decide this and what those violations are. There's no other real option. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, is that uh, it's, it's kind of a trick bag. I mean, you know, that there's no in between and that they get to decide. What, do you, what are your thoughts in terms of that, uh, that, that fact? So the, the MMMA was reform legislation put together by the people, um, and it exempted 
medical marijuana from the really harsh provisions of the public health code. That's all there is. So if you don't fit into the MMMA, you wind up with facing regular you know, possession or in say or delivery penalties for marijuana. This you know, and so one way around that, of course, is that if the my legalized petition gets on the ballot, all that disappears, um, and the marijuana will be, be completely legal for anyone except juveniles or those who are driving cars. Um, but you're quite right. There is no middle ground right now. And you know, you you are right. And, and let's not uh, let's not kick the dead horse laying over there with a couple injured legs. Okay, let's let's talk about am I legalized if we can. Yeah. Um, and you're right, because it, 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 is, it is the, you know, most progressive, I wouldn't say progressive, because that may be interpreted poorly. I think it's the most fair, you know, legislation that's been put together in terms of really taking a swing at meaningful legalization. You know, a lot of people can define that a lot of different ways, but to make it so that it is a civil infraction as a penalty for everything, you know, independent of the violations is as close as you're going to get to um, a legalization. And yeah, we, we think it was a really uh, a well done uh, proposal. I confess I helped put it together. Um, so it has to be wonderful. Well, let me ask you this, because I think we're all on the same page. And, you know, and of course, taking a stab at that with the, the you know, diversity of opinion within the medical or in, you know reform community is it's dangerous almost, you know, trying to put all those together. But I, I would agree that it is a very happy ground. But looking beyond that, let's say it gets on the ballot, do you, do you suspect that, um, you know, there's a, there's a huge group, I think, that, you know, understand and, you know, like the idea of being able to, as an adult over 21 or however old, purchase an ounce or two of marijuana, drive home, and not worry about getting arrested. And that does not contemplate, like, am I legalized? You know, it's because am I legalized would you know, go beyond that and it would allow the next door neighbor to grow marijuana. And if it was too much, it would just be a civil infraction. It adds all these other pieces. Do you think that that, you know, some of those, you know, what the opponents would say would be enough to derail its campaign, knowing how, you know, the popularity of, of legalization is right now in Michigan? No, I don't think so. Um, the restrictions we've got are fairly modest. And remember, the people have to approve this once it gets on the ballot. And we're very worried about being attacked by law and order groups. Oh, save the little children, you know. Um, and what about uh, driving while uh, stoned? Yeah. So we kept some penalties in there for those kinds of things. So we think it's a moderate, <laughs> a moderate proposal, and it should pass easily once we manage to convince the Supreme Court to order it on the ballot. Let's talk about that, because that's really what the... Uh, that is what is of the moment. Um, we got that terrible ruling from the Court of Claims kind of ignoring what seemed to be some precedent and, you know, kind of use its discretion to whatever. But open it up, I think, with, you know, you put some language in suggesting that it was an issue that needed to be heard. The strategy now is it's before the Supreme Court. Tell us what your thoughts are. Is there a time frame? Is, are we still, is, is the reality of it getting on the November ballot a thing? Are we now discussing another... Uh, Date is a, is a date that it would be on a ballot. What are your thoughts on that? Well, my view is that we have a, a good chance of having the Supreme Court act on this and order the Board of Canvassers to essentially count our signatures that were gathered more than 180 days after we started um, using the sampling method that's in the qualified voter file. And remember, Michael, this is not just about marijuana. This is about the right of the people to legislate directly through an initiative petition. And this goes back over 100 years to the so-called progressive era in American politics, when a wide variety of reforms were put in to open up the government. For example, direct election of U.S. senators. At the state level, there was a, a, the traditional three-item package of progressive legislation, initiative, the right to initiate directly, recall, the right to call to throw people out of office before their terms, end, and referendum, the right of the people to vote on legislation that the legislature has adopted but has not yet taken effect. So these were major advances, and Michigan 
It's been in Michigan's Constitution, an early form was in there in the 1908 Constitution. So, ever since the modern era, legislatures are tempted to cut back on the rights of the people to legislate directly. Because legislatures say to themselves, well, the people elected us to legislate, so why should we allow them to legislate directly? So the most recent, uh, most recent series of events started in the early 1970s when a citizen was proposing an initiative proposal to regulate legislators' pay. <laughs> That's when they started talking about a 180-day limit. And now it's gone back and forth. There have been various incarnations. But the legislature will always want to cut back. This stuff right now is in the state constitution on initiated laws. We're trying to initiate a law here. And the issue, the major issue in our case is, to what extent can the legislature or the executive, that is the board of state canvassers, cut back on that state constitutional right? We say, well, it's perfectly okay for the legislature legislature to set point size and petition forms. But other than that, the legislature is not allowed to set restrictions, like time limits on when signatures can be gathered. And the Michigan Supreme Court has gone back and forth on this. Um, and what we're asking the Supreme Court is to take the position it's already taken and say, no, this 180-day stuff is unconstitutional. It violates the state constitutional right to initiate laws. And once you've got an initiative provision in your state constitution, then that becomes fundamental core political speech, as we say in the trade, like voting. And any restriction that the legislature puts on that right is subject to very careful scrutiny by the courts. And we're saying, essentially, there's no reason for the 180-day limit. And so we're asking the court to toss it out. That's the gist of it. Now, so. Tell me this. Um, does this... Does, is there any way that it, that there's a, that the uh, legislation that specifically was recently passed and signed by the uh, standard, is it, does this come into play at all? It, doesn't that act then in and of itself do do the same thing? Is that is that the well? No, yeah. the only thing that's before the legislature right. now, this past one chamber, is the reform of the Medical uh, Marijuana Act. I understand. I opinion. think it's two or three times now. The House, State House, has passed some significant reform legislation that would allow medibles no, no. I'm talking and, I'm uh, talking about sn- sh- sh- in the form that we're used to them the, and every time chip. the Senate has said we're not interested and right now pending in the Senate is the House package and the Senate is saying we're not interested I know, but hey so Dave what about the the uh, the law it's now Public Act 142, I believe, formerly Senate Bill 776, that clearly limits gathering for statutory initiatives to 180 days. Michael wants to know if that will have a, uh, be an issue for us. No, because it doesn't affect us. The law was signed after we filed our petitions. And the Attorney General said, well, that doesn't apply to this petition drive. But it's one more example. I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, like everything you just said would apply to the argument that the legislature should never be able to even encroach on this at all, and they just did, yes. you know, independent. And, and you're right, I agree. It's, it's not about, you know, I, I mean, it's not about marijuana. It's about the voter initiative process and the constitutional right of citizens to be able to change the law if they don't like it. Yes. Core principle of our Constitution. Um, what happens with the Public Act 142 is it doesn't affect our case but it does affect the fracking petition that was tossed out by the Court of Claims. And the Court of Claims essentially said, well, come back when you've got your signatures. Um, they said the case was what we call moot. Right. Um, but this, this Public Act 142 is continues the legislative trend of trying to, to restrict people's initiatives. And as we say in our brief, what's to prevent the legislature from setting a 10-day limit on when you collect and collect signatures. 
Nothing. Right. Why should there be a limit? There's, it's, 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 yeah. a, it's a legislatively created limit. That's what we're saying, right? That's right. It's amazing. Um, and obviously, yeah. the, the other side of it is it's... it's, it's um, I mean, there's all the other realities, like policy arguments. I don't know if you guys got into that at all, but, like, you know, the, the reality of who could come forth and accomplish such a task unless they were, you know, fu- you know, funded with millions of dollars, right? To be able to accomplish that within that period of time, it would have to be, yes. it would limit an exclusive yes. group of individuals. Yes, that's one argument that we made to the Supreme Court. Um so we hope we buy that. They buy that argument. Um, what do you think the best argument is? The one that that uh, carries the ball across the the goal line. I think the best argument is that the legislature doesn't have the authority to limit um, initiative petitions except for such things as type style. That all this is out the door, and um, so as long as you have valid signatures, it doesn't matter how long you take to collect them. That's what I hope the court decides. I think it's a strong argument. Yeah. It's a, an argument based on existing court decisions from the Michigan Supreme Court. And we just think the court of claims is wrong. <laughs> now, also, and it really is. That, overly, th- that is the role of the court, isn't it? I mean, they're, to, you know, play, yeah. they're the, last ba- the last decider of, you know, what is, you know. Yes, the Michigan Supreme Court can do anything. Its court rules say so. <laughs> And we filed two cases in front of the Supreme Court within a few days of each other. One of them takes advantage of a special law that gives people upset by what the Board of Canvassers to do has done to file directly with the Supreme Court. That's the first case. Second case is we appealed the decision of the Court of Claims and asked the Supreme Court to decide that case before the Court of Appeals gets it, because the Court of Appeals will take months. So we've asked what we call for a bypass of the Court of Appeals. Both of those cases are now in front of the Supreme Court, and we're waiting for them to do something. Yes, they can change the election deadlines. And, and, Dave, and Dave, isn't it true that the, uh, the case that we went directly to the Supreme Court was similar to our case of the Court of Claims? But in the appeal, we got to talk about what the judge did. But we can talk about this when we come back at the end of this. Hang on just for a couple minutes, Dave, and we'll talk about this again. We'll take a little break. Thanks, Dave. Hold on. Stay with us. Don't put that out. We'll be right back with more Planet Green Trees. If you <laughs> missed the last Full Melt show, you missed a lot. In uh, San Ali County, the police took plants that just got cut down, took the big stalks, went and laid them out, dried them out, and then trimmed up the marijuana and put it into jars and used that against somebody in the court of law. <laughs> so it's wait, like, wait, so wait, we're wait, paying wait. police officers to trim marijuana now. They're, they're pretend caregivers. They got on their little maid's outfits and they got their, <laughs> their little gloves on and their little scissors and they're all happy, playing with the weed. The Full Melt Show is live 7 to 8 Eastern on the FullMelt.com. I've seen things no man should bear and those that every man should dare. From the beaches of Normandy to the far reaches of the earth. In my life, I have lived millions of lives. I've outrun robots and danced with dinosaurs. I faced the faces of fear and fortitude and witnessed great beauty in the making. I've kept the company of kings and queens, but I'm no royalty or saint. I've traveled, trekked, wandered, and roamed, only to find myself right where I belong. Jeep. See your authorized Jeep retailer for details on how you can become a Jeep owner. 
Root Metrics, in the nation's largest independent study, tested wireless performance across the country. Verizon won big with 153 state wins. AT&T got 38, Sprint got 2, and T-Mobile got 0. Verizon also won first in the U.S. for data, call, speed, and reliability. AT&T got text. Stuck on an average network? Join Verizon, and we'll cover your cost to switch. Attention. Get ready to write down a very important number. Michael does not know how to fail. Second place is loser. If you have a medical marijuana case and need legal representation, call the best, attorney Michael Camorn. He's very passionate in the courtroom. Getting the best outcome requires quick legal action, and it needs to start with one call. Toll free to attorney Michael Camorn. 800-656-3557. Write it down. 800-656-3557. Michael Camorn gave us our life back. Attorney Michael Camorn. Vigorous criminal defense. Plato Compound can help kids practice communication skills. Start by presenting the visual of the letter or word. Then ask them to mold the Play-Doh compound into the shape of the letters. It's an effective way to foster speech and even writing. And now more Planet Green Dreams. All righty, we're back. And we are uh, still with uh, Dave Cahill is, uh, on the line. Dave, are you still there? Yeah, hi. Fantastic. Nice to deal Th- with you. Thanks for staying with us. We're talking, of course, about the uh, next phases of MI Legalized. Two curtain actions that are uh, pending. We're waiting uh, for them to respond in some way. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Um, the what, what's is, is there? Uh, well, can I, I was, can I ask a question right at the end of the last break? Because we can bring it back to him if that's okay. And that and that was Hello? Uh, we have. Yeah, can you hear me, Dave? Well, you're cutting in and out, but if you can hear me, that's all that really matters. Yes, okay, exactly. all right. <laughs> well, we have uh, we have the two cases. One is the direct route to the Supreme Court uh, because of the State Department issue, and that's very similar to our complaints in the Court of Claims. But in the other action, we've included what the issues are that we have with the judge's decision in the Court of Claims. That's right, to bring a lot of these... <laughs> Um, issues more squarely in front of the Supreme Court. Um, they will probably be consolidating both cases, and they can do anything they want. We've asked for what's called a peremptory reversal of the Court of Claims decision. We have asked them, uh, um, you know, and, and they may ask the Attorney General for their response on behalf of the uh, Board of State canvassers. Um, we hope they do something fairly quickly. The first ballot printing deadline is September 9th, but the court has in the past uh, extended ballot printing deadlines in just this kind of case. So we're essentially crossing our fingers and waiting for the court to enter some kind of order stating what the next step is or giving us the relief that we want. Will you uh, recall for us the... uh precedent that you're referring to of situations when the Supreme Court specifically has, you know, changed the deadlines and, and what on what issues, you know, what were the issues that, uh, you know, were effectuated by it or well, persons? The issues were essentially the same. Uh, they had a complex dispute over a petition. I think it was the Ferency case. Uh, we filed a 57-page brief a couple of days ago um, with the Supreme Court. Um and that's discussed in loving detail. Um, so we we feel confident that the court can and probably will change the filing deadlines, the pr- printing deadlines, and all of that kind of stuff to accommodate the board of canvassers acting under the Supreme Court's order to count all of our signatures. And if we get the the number we need, then it goes on the ballot. This is not an ordinary process, but this is not an ordinary situation. Yeah, this is unique. This is, nobody else has been in this situation and before. That's right. So, I understand they can move the. Uh, I mean, the Supreme Court moves slowly. Obviously, it's hard to get them to the front of their line. They take thousands of get thousands of thousands of. Uh, 
applications, and they only take with like a couple hundred. Is that what it is? You know, two, three hundred a year. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we got. A, this is an election case, and they can act almost instantaneously. Actually, the court clerk said that they were expecting the case to come in when we <coughs> filed the first one. So they know it's there. Okay. And it depends on if the justices want to do anything. I hope they do. Just her saying that in that context kind of adds drama to the thing, whether it's true or not. You know, like, she could have been like, someone could have, you know, said, but it's funny, like, you know, they could get the collective idea that they're sitting around and, oh, when do we get in that case? We want to start ruling on that. I mean, it sounds like yeah, it. Yeah, you know. I, I don't think they're going to be sitting around, frankly. No, I know. This has had so much publicity. And the issues are serious enough that I expect the Supreme Court to act. Certainly. And I, and I agree with you. And you're right. I wasn't downplaying it, but it's just, you know, it's an interesting leak of information. It's kind of, you know, it's like what you want to hear and yeah. probably, you know, favorable on the issue or whatnot. But um, so, but do you still, uh, I mean, I guess the timing is it. I mean, the, the reality is if something's going to happen, it's going to happen soon, right? Yes. By like Tuesday, yeah. Right. Like, uh, I don't know, at least by the 9th. You got to think. Well, something. Tuesday would give them a couple days to like actually count the signatures through the most modern methods, which is enough time, and then they could print by the ninth and stay on track. That, that's just yeah. the ideal to end it up with. Yeah. So we're just waiting. Well, the Supreme Court's got to act by then, like to tomorrow or something. Yeah, it, it, by it could. Yeah, by right. Tuesday. But I'm saying that. All right. Well. Well, they because they, it's an election issue. And, I understand, and kind of stuff but they got they got to take the issue and they got to analyze it. Maybe they're already ahead of it. I mean, it's not like it's you know I don't know that they're all that wise on the you know litigated this. Some of them have no idea. This may be their first uh, election case that they're dealing with. You know, right? There's some newbies on there. I mean, you know, they, they may they may be favorable. <laughs> they're pretty smart though. I know they are. And, and not all of them. We've made this not pretty straightforward in parts of it. Some know. of them are federalists or something. You know, some weird philosophy. Good. Viviano, whatever. I don't think so. I think the issue is clear enough, and it takes almost no time to do a sampling of signatures on a petition, which is what they did, and they divided them into two categories, one within the 180 days and the other outside the 180 days, and we had a high enough percentage of valid signatures on the ones within the 180 days that we're certain that we're going to be qualified uh, with uh, once they analyze the peti- the signatures beyond the 180 days, this is not rocket science. It's fairly simple and straightforward, and it happens. You can do this. Yeah, I expect in a few hours of staff work. Hey, so uh, you know, we were talking with uh, Jeff Frazier earlier about possibly uh, moving into federal court, uh, depending on the set of circumstances that come before us in the next few days. And I think Jeff was in, was uh, interested in discussing that. Yeah, it's always a possibility because there are federal constitutional issues of this core right of political speech, and the federal courts have been fairly active in policing state <coughs> restrictions on petition drives. A couple of years ago, uh, Congressman Conyers was not allowed to be on the ballot initially because of problems with his petition circulators. He went to federal court, and he won. Yeah, they, they'll uphold the First Amendment, and states are trying to restrict it. That's, uh, and that's, all, that's the whole certification for doctors, the you know, doctor certifications, and why they, they couldn't enjoin them from doing that, because it's a First Amendment right, you know, to talk freely with a patient in their office. That's, that's where that was... Conan v. Walters or whatever, but that, you know that's. I agree with you. That's a. Uh, that's the analysis, not beyond it. It's not about the substantive issue. The substantive issue is the First Amendment. I mean, well, yeah, yeah this core political right. Ed, Ed, do you see the federal court as a backstop to the Michigan Supreme Court's action or perhaps inaction? Well, we'll just have to see what happens. I mean, it's always a possibility. It's not a big deal to redo our papers to file them in federal court, but we hope the Michigan Supreme Court acts. Yeah. It's in front of them now. They should. Let me ask you this. With the optimism that you have that the Supreme Court will take the case and do the right thing, how do you reconcile that with our judicial system or general explanation for the Court of Appeals and the 
havoc that they generally cause. And I'll include the Court of Claims in that because they are Court of Appeals of Justices. Well, every, every court is different. Um, every case is different. Everybody believes they're doing the right thing. Mm. Um, and nobody is saying that uh, any of the court decisions here were, you know, evil. We just think they're wrong. Um, and I think that's an important distinction to make. So um, we have high hopes for the Supreme Court. Uh, they were pretty vigorous in uh, the year 2012 on that case involving a type size of a petition. <laughs> and so uh, I feel pretty good about where we are. That's good. It's, uh, it's too bad it had to be litigated like this. And I think... Uh you know, if this is to be put to a jury trial, I know it's not. It's a total legal issue. But it's one of those things where, like, the, you know, there's so many equities on the side of the, the people. You know, it's like such a, like, if the, you know, the people could decide this, they'd say, what, are you kidding me? You're going to do what? You know, it would only be some weird, twisted, mm -hmm. legal menangering that would be done in a political that would ever, like, nobody, no no community, a person's group, whatever, you know, take 10 people, put them together. Would ever want? Am I right? Just at least to have the right have to. It's like a, it's West, like it's have a protection. You been to West Michigan lately? <laughs> I hear you, um, but <laughs> West. You mean the citizens of Western Michigan? <laughs> the juries. No, the, All right. The people right. of Michigan are I understand. not uniformly in favor of marijuana. Yeah, but <laughs> but but they would be they would be. Uh, as we know, but as we know, there's no right to a jury trial in this kind of case. Of course, but I'm um, saying, as a principle, this would be an it's an un, it's unpopular. I think it would be unpopular. I think most people would agree that this is an overreach, it's an infringement on what people would. You know, like, like most people, they said, "Do you want? Do you want the government to res be to restrict this now, so you can never have the ability to do this, or would you like just to keep it open, just in case you choose to later on? Like, which one do you want? You know, you know. I mean, like, I don't think it's a, it's not it's a no brainer. The only popular vote is the one on the election day. Um, this right. is not a matter of polls or. Um, a random sampling. So we'll just have to wait and see what courts well, do. You know. Well, I know, and I'm not. I'm not arguing with you. And you're absolutely right. And you keep framing it on point with very strong legal principles. I'm kind of floating off into some emotional mambo jambo. But I, you know, I'm yeah, just well, saying, like, if, if this I, this idea is so adverse to what we would describe as the principles of democracy, people don't understand how sometimes this shit happens. You know, constitutional that's issues. That's why. That's why the state constitution has this provision in it, hmm. you see, yes. is to prevent this stuff from happening. And the legislature and the board of canvassers say, oh, well, we can do what we want and cut your rights back. We say, no, you can't <laughs> do that. Yes. That's real simple. You're right. It is real simple. It's, uh, what I'm saying and getting at, which is an, another fantasy, but if, like <laughs> fourth, am fourth Amendment issues could be decided by juries, <laughs> or you could find somebody not guilty because the... The jury with whatever they know thinks that that's... That kind of bothers me. I don't really like that. Or maybe they... Nah, I don't know. Okay. Not, I mean, it's a, it's not a thing, but I think if that was... You know you know what I'm saying? You get a lot of different rulings or little... You know, you get the favor, right? You know what I mean? Maybe. Well, I prefer to stick to what we've got now. I know. I just... Uh, <laughs> don't find the judicial it. system in general. Um, because there are so many different issues raised in so many different ways. Um... And jury nullification doesn't cut it, as you know, Mike. I know, I know. I was just playing with the. I was You're just going playing off the, again. See. Well, it's a, you know I think well the, the the idea of of the passing of that legislation that would impede upon the number of votes. I think that's something that's you know, I mean people. It's not a, that's not a popular. That wasn't done for constituents. Like tell me, constituents that were like pushing that was our lobby group for that. What citizens lobby group or organization? For profit, not for was backing that leg like who introduced that? Well, Under what for what what was who's that the the, the legislation seven seventy. Yeah, right? it was seven seventy six. APAC. Oh. Um I'm I guess Hey Dave, well. that's gonna do it for, for this discussion on Am I legalized tonight. Sorry I got the, the segments ending here, but thank you very much and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Dave, appreciate it. Thanks for hey.
Planet Green Tree call. Show is produced Please in association with and made possible by try. the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association. Co-host Chad Carr. News Director Rick Thompson. Produced by Jamie Lowell. Copyright 2016. Planet Green Tree. But there is one voice that has never been heard before. The voice of old Mr. World himself. The way he might sound if he could speak to us in our own language. Mr. World, how was this wonderful orderly earth of ours formed in the first place? And how long has it been going on? Well, if a few people do decide to swing one way or another, it might actually pass. Uh, this property is used to grow with manufacturing marijuana. And the judge said he needed a timeout, so he took his belt and his shoes and his tie and put him in a locker. We're traveling through a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a wireless transmitter. Measure time and light. Astonishing, perhaps, but you can find it in a place that's known as... Planet Green Trees! Attention, ladies and gentlemen, the Planet Green Trees show is underway with your host, attorney Michael Camor. Alrighty, we're back. Thanks for staying with us. Planet Green Trees, episode 315. Or something. And we're calling it what? Oh, yeah, heaven is a warm gun. That's right. So apparently Rick Thompson is not feeling well. We wish him his, uh, our best. He's the news director, and this is usually the time where we would let him go on and on about the news flow. Let's talk about some things in the news uh, for a couple of seconds. I know we have Captain Kirk calling in at, uh, shortly, and we're going to... Uh, Chad, you brought up earlier in the show about the ninth, ninth circuit. Yes, federal Happy, court. That's the whole reason why with the show, the the name of the show, happiness is a warm gun. I mean, you get that? There's a, so. Oh, guns! No, I didn't get it, but uh, <laughs> let's talk <laughs> oh, about it anyway. It's a Beatles reference, but uh, I don't expect you to understand rock and roll. I don't even know what it was. I don't expect you to understand rock and roll. <laughs> like if I said white album, you'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah, anyway, right. so the. Uh, yeah, white. <laughs> so, I you know, who wants to opine on the opinion? Who uh, you got some? Where's where's a lawyer? What's going on? Where are the lawyers? Where are they well, going? Well, it's obvious if somebody uses cannabis that they are totally and radically fucked up, and they shouldn't handle. Let me say this. Let me say this. Where's Eric Gunnels? Right. Where's Eric Gunnels? Eric Gunnels, we need you to call in immediately. Or whatever. Because it's a Second Amendment issue. Me, it's a Second Amendment issue. Gary Johnson on Facebook. Here, let me say it to you. This. this is very strange to me, and I would never, ever, ever have expected it to go down like this. I didn't read the opinion in full. I will say this. I did some research on the, the state law. Here we go. Um, I will say this, that at, at the state level... There are several issues that we have yet to address in Michigan that are be, have been addressed in other courts. doesn't mean that it's going to go the same way in Michigan, but usually it's a pattern and a, a trend. Courts are going to look to and rely on, assuming that it's rational or reasonable, you know, when they have the same issues and circumstances that come up. And that has been the case. One example is, where's Jeff Frazier like talking about this? The probable cause, smell of marijuana. Arizona, Massachusetts. Alaska require de-verification, de-verification of someone's involvement as a medical marijuana patient or caregiver before a warrant for probable cause can be issued. Gunnels is on the line? All right. Good. I guess we have uh, my favorite Thetford Township, what is he? Trustee. Trustee. And uh, activist turned politician Eric Gunnel, is that true? Gun advocate. That's true. All right, good. Thank you for calling in and appreciate it responding so quickly about seven seconds later than I expected. The issue here, Eric, is that the <laughs> Ninth Circuit has declared that medical marijuana patients um, and caregivers, caregivers, patients specifically, no caregivers, patients are precluded or can be precluded from the selling of uh, guns to. And uh, I want to know, where, where's the NRA on this? What, why is this class of persons? What other class of persons are precluded currently as people that cannot buy guns? I know who they are. You know who they are? Felons. 
the mentally ill, people and persons that are intoxicated, felons, because while the government recognizes that there's a Second Amendment right to, Second Amendment right to uh, bear arms, which some say is like the, the, it doesn't matter. But the right to bear arms, that can be, it's not, it's not exclusive, it's not absolute. This is how it's been interpreted, that the government has some vested interests in restricting those, that right, and they have defined them. This happens in other constitutional rights as well, right? Like Fourth Amendment, no warrants required if exigent circumstances or you know, community, community safety exceptions or what have you, plain view. You know, these things exist. I don't like it. I'm reporting it as it is. But as we turn to this, how do medical marijuana patients get into that category, Eric? What, what are we doing about this? Well, uh, I, I don't understand how it, you can have a constitutional right infringed upon when you have both constitutional <laughs> right to have a medical marijuana license. And, and We're going on a break. Going on a break, Eric. We'll talk to, you in, talk to you in a minute. Hold on. I promise I'll let you talk. I promise. Hang in there. The Planet Green Trees Show. Hey, this is Willie for normal. Have you ever met anybody before who's been busted on marijuana charges? This year in our country, over 850,000 citizens are arrested on marijuana-related charges. That's another marijuana smoker busted every 35 seconds. 90% for possession only. For the first time since marijuana was made illegal in 1937, Congress is finally looking at a bill to re-legalize marijuana. The U.S. Congress is considering legalization that permits individual states to set public policies that will allow them to legally control and tax marijuana. To find out more about this important congressional bill, please contact Normal at 202-483-5500 or on the web at normal.org. Fantastic guest bloggers, incredible photography, and cutting-edge information separates the Compassion Chronicles from all other websites. Sign up for your newsletter today. Since 2012, the Compassion Chronicles has been delivering news and information for Michigan's patient community and beyond. From breaking news to science articles to networking and event information, Michigan turns to the Compassion Chronicles when patients and caregivers need to know the score. Edited by Rick Thompson, winner of the Crystal Trichrome Award for Journalist of the Year and named Citizen Activist of the Year 2015 by The Weed Blog. TheCompassionChronicles.com Join the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association today. MichiganMedicalMarijuana.org The MMMA is focused on the well-being and safety of medical marijuana patients. The MMMA site provides the most comprehensive and up-to-date news on legal issues, politics, research, cultivation, as well as the various strange products and methods of cannabis use. Come join the discussion with the most knowledgeable and passionate advocates in Michigan today. MichiganMedicalMarijuana.org And now back to more Planet Green Trees. All righty, we're back. Thanks for staying with us. I know we have Eric Gunnels uh, on hold and the Captain Kirk in the queue, so we've got a lot of excitement. I do have to make a public, the Planet Green Trees public service announcement. announcement. Our dear friend, who sometimes I forget to do the shout-out for and has been in the queue a couple of times, wanted to do the legal report, Alan Peisner, is uh, commenting, and I need to mention that, <coughs> saying there's too many breaks that interrupt the content of the show. Now, this is an important point. First of all, it took us a lot of time to get our security back in order because for the Alan's departure. But he's still invited back. But the issue of this is, is hard for us because we, we, we are lacking in people to vote within the studio. So it's, it's one of these things that it had the right people. But I agree with you, Alan. I agree with you. I'll make that clear. Returning now to uh, Eric Gunnels, Second Amendment uh, discussion. What? <laughs> Captain Kirk on because he's got an opinion, I'm sure, too. Bring Captain Kirk on. 
Kevin Kirk, thanks this, for this issue is also discriminatory toward cannabis users versus other prescription medication users. Of course it is. Especially since it's uh, or drinkers even Michael. actually. But mental illness, which is a specifically defined characteristic and may fall into categories that people take med- medications for. Um you know, I mean like like, like Xanax. I'm talking about Xanax or Soma or some of these other like you know What's the sleeping ones? Uh, you Ambient. Know. Ambient. Ambient. Yeah, whatever. All right, fine. Captain Kirk, you're on, and so is Eric. Captain Kirk, first, welcome to the show, and how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. How are you? Good. We were going to talk about it. I do want to ask you some questions about the uh, High Times Country Cannabis Cup and uh, the uh, your experiences there and some of the awards and whatnot. But we're talking about this gun thing here, and... Uh, what are your thoughts on it? We were talking about the ability to restrict the sale of guns to patients because they're medical marijuana users. Well, of course, I find it BS, but, you know, I, I don't see how they can take that amendment away from us. It is, Michael, is, can I ask you this? Yes, Erica. Can, can I ask you this? Are they, are they treating the Second Amendment as if, though, it's like a privilege, like a automobile driver's license? Not a right. Is that how they're kind of? Is that how it's kind of like played out? No. Listen. There's an analysis of how this goes down. They don't do it any different for the Second Amendment. Same analysis right, for the First I mean, Amendment. I mean, right. I mean, but it's almost like a, it's like how can you have a constitutional right if it's not a right if it's like a, if they're treating it like Sorry. a privilege? No, that's a good I mean, question. Like, there's the same analogy for the MMA. As I even mentioned this in the the rant at the beginning. You know, there's different terms and phrases that have been used to de- define it in the court of appeals so it's in in the supreme court some have said it you know medical marijuana is still illegal unless you are in this limited compliance and then you have immunity but at the same time there's a case that says you have a right you know patients have a right exactly. to acquire so th- those are two entirely different things and uh right. that's the point that you are making the right the you know my my brief reading of it and i'm not going to be held to this but uh is that there has to be a finding that the individuals fall within this generally accepted category of individuals who create a danger, an identifiable danger of some kind that allows the and that the government's interest in restricting that constitutional right is, you know, more important than the individual's right. It's one of those greater good things. Like, you know, Yes, you have a Second Amendment right. right to possess a gun. It's, this is the, these are the categories. Let's, let's be clear. You have a right to possess a gun, own a gun, unless you're drunk. So this person must be as bad as someone who would be dangerous with a gun because they're drunk. Or someone who's got mental illness and therefore could not be trusted to remain, you know, whatever. Right, you know. But, Michael, are, are but Michael, are they stating that according to the fact that marijuana remains a Schedule One? Because according to what you said in the earlier rant, under the preamble of the Medical Marijuana Act, the, the voters of the state of Michigan declared it a medicine. Therefore, it cannot be held accountable, accountable to us federally on a federal firearms form. I mean, that's, that's yeah, but that, Eric, that, Eric, course, Eric but, you know, the strength of you, the strength of your argument is that to defeat this federal ruling, you're relying on, you know, the Michigan state. medical state law. That's not going to work. I think um, right, okay. this okay. is where it's going to go. The question is whether or not. You know, the states are going to follow it or not. And I would say they can't. It can't be, you know. But the problem is that the regulation of the guns is done through the it's, federal it's, government. It's federal if you buy it from a right. firearms dealer. Right. But the, right. the, the act yeah. clearly states that we are to be denied no privilege. And my point is that every single state that's addressed this issue is an Oregon case. Montana was the first one. <clears throat> they even did a movie about it. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like uh, Montana versus Willis. And what they said is, it went all the way to the Montana Supreme Court, and they said that uh, they can't do this. It's a right. You know, there's no way you can restrict a gun. Montana, they're going to restrict a guy's gun because he's a patient or caregiver. A, never. And then Oregon followed. And, um, and this is the way it's going to go. If the states are going to resolve this issue, there's, like, I, I, I've had that case. I, I, I've been waiting for someone to, you know, let's ride this one in the Supreme Court because it's such a great issue. In, in other words, to restrict the individual's Second Amendment right to possess a gun under state law, under state law, without some 
reason when the state is see because because state law has authorized individuals to drive within their system and and not be criminalized. All right, we can't talk about it anymore. You have to hold Eric because we got Captain Kirk only for a short time. Okay. Captain Kirk, back to you. Let, let's hear about your uh, experiences at the uh, the cup this last time. What did you think com- this one did compared to the other one for, earlier? Uh, I think this was a very good cup. Uh, no matter what I think about it or not. Thing that I did find out, you know, after going down there the second time, you know, we had one in July and we had one here just, you know, last weekend. But the folks that live there in the Clio and the surrounding area absolutely love it. The businesses, it, it brings a lot of uh, money into their area, which Flint has not only been abandoned by, uh, I'd say, our Michigan government, but it's kind of abandoned by the auto industry and everybody around it. So any events that can be held up that way to help those folks out, earn every penny they can uh, i support it well you know what uh you have created an event in the flint area and you had the first one last year and i want to talk about the cup and some other stuff for a minute but since you brought that up why don't you tell people about uh your uh event well coming up on october 29th which is a saturday we decided to do it a couple of days before halloween That way people could be with their kids and go trick-or-treating. But we came up with the idea of last year actually laying in the hospital to throw a party for the community. To bury the hatchet was the name of the original name of the party. And for one night, come together, no fighting, no politics, no bitching, no money raising, nothing. Just have a good time um, and throw a great big party. Well, for last year, we had around 430 people, give or take a few. And everything was paid for by the sponsors. We fed 500, uh, had enough food for 500. We had T-shirts for 500. We had a magician there. We had a crystal ball reader. We had all kinds of things, decorations, music, gas stations, volcano stations. We even had a, uh, a caramel and chocolate sauce dipping booth, unmedicated, because we want to make sure people make it home safely. And again, everything was free, and this was paid for by the sponsors. And again, it, it turned out so good that it was beyond beyond what I thought it would turn into. And um, it actually turned into such a big thing that we're doing it again this year. And we will be holding it in Flint at Vehicle City. And it's, it's already turned into, we're expecting around 500 to 550 people. And that's probably be at our capacity. Last year, the only complaints that we had is it was, uh, and we had a great venue last year. I would like to thank the Jam Shack for hosting this last year, but it kind of grew bigger than that. So we've got a new uh, venue this year. It's very beautiful, and Happy Skunk Works in, in Vehicle City is having us. So with that said, again, it's a good party. It's, it's sponsored by <coughs> folks in the community who want to give back to the community, and this is for patients. And again absolutely free food entry everything and i do want to add one more thing you do need to have your your michigan card and your id we will also be accepting out-of-state cards but with those cards they need to have an id for that example if someone comes in with a california medical card and wants to show me an arizona id that will not work all right to put that out there I, I went to the Dabween party last year, uh, uh, Captain Kirk. It was, a, it was a fantastic time. It was a great time. And, of course, uh, Eric is a, uh, is a trustee of the township that's right by the, uh, the event. And, as you said, that benefits the area around there. And, and I'm sure Eric gets oh, to see fun. that. The yeah, there's, 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 there's no doubt about it, um, Jamie and everybody, that, that uh, the Canvas Cup and the whole you know, medical marijuana community has benefited the whole Genesee County area, I would say, and the whole surrounding Flint area. Hey, so, Captain, uh, why did you start making uh, medibles? What got you interested in doing that in the first place? Actually, it all happened back in the very beginning when, you know, you were there. We were building Third Coast. And it was a little bit before that because before you opened up Third Coast, we were doing what we called Compassion Clubs. And back then, the name Compassion Club really meant where we were meeting in libraries. And we were teaching each other things at libraries and, and learning things there because... At that point in time, we didn't have a third coast. There wasn't a club. There wasn't anything on the East Coast. And a lot of growers were really meeting privately. So what we, again, back then, they were called Compassion Clubs. And I was with the Brighton Compassion Club back then with Doug Orton. And I went into the hospital up here 
in the University of Michigan, and they treated me really, really bad. I have multiple sclerosis, and they found so much THC in me that they told me I was a drug seeker and wouldn't give me any meds or any medication or anything to help me what I was going through. And I do remember Doug showing up and a friend of his, and they brought me back. You know, Doug was also known as the Muffin Man and brought me a muffin. And I ate it really very quickly. You know, it was almost embarrassing how quick I ate it, kind of like the cookie monster on Sesame Street. And I, I got relief from it. The next thing I know, I woke up and there was a note that said, hey, brother, I'm glad to see you got some rest. Love you. Talk to you soon. And I thought, wow, right then and there, the, a little brownie or a little cupcake or, excuse me, a little muffin at that time could do something like that to me. I thought, I need to get into this because at that point in time, I was on Oxycontin. I was on all kinds of prescription drugs or, or just actually finish, finishing off getting off those the first part of 2007. And um, it helped me get off a lot of pain pills and drugs. I mean, I've, I'm, I've got over 80 staples in my body, and I usually end up in the hospital two, three times a year for my MS attacks. But the, I was on so many medications that I, it was just horrible. And it, and it caused me a lot of other, other horrible things due to taking those medications, like my diverticulitis and pancreatitis. I mean, the insides of me have been ate up from all the acetaphetamine and all the medications and, the, and along with all the other stuff. So again, I really wanted to get into something, and, and I will also never forget sitting at the University of Michigan and having a talk with a doctor there. And it was the cardiologist, and he came in, you know, and he was like, you know, you need to get into vaporizing and, and this. And I said, look, it doesn't work for me. It's not a vehicle that works for me. And he was like, well, you know, Mr. Reed, there's so many, so many brownies and cupcakes you can eat. Before I knew it, we had a conversation there, and the guy was in my room, the doctor was in my room for over an hour. And I explained to him, it's more than brownies and cupcakes. We can do it into anything now, tailored to a special patient. Um, meats, jerkies, uh, it, it doesn't just have to be a dessert into drinks. You know, there are better ways that we can get this into our system a lot cleaner. And he was fascinated with all this. And by the time he left, he really agreed with me and... Uh, I remember him saying, you know, I've, I've got a different outlook on things now. <coughs> so every now and then you get to run across doctors and hospitals and stuff, and they will listen to you as long as you're not screaming at them or trying to vape inside a hospital or, you know, I've seen a, a lot of mistakes like that when people go to the hospital. And, and I'm sorry, when I go to the hospital, the last thing I'm really worried about is smoking a joint. Right. And don't get me wrong, it, it, it crosses my mind in there. But when people go in there, I see a lot of people trying to pull out their vaporizers and volcanoes hitting it and stuff and do it in the hospital and they're like hey guys serious man i mean really i mean sometimes i don't get that and i get a little right. frustrated with folks that do do that because sure. i mean if you stop and look at it you're kind of looking like an idiot but i'll get off on my high horse yeah that, so that's, so that's you went on point. you went on to uh create stuff that was really desirable for a lot of people i know that uh a lot of our patients at third coast have really liked what you've made and and now a lot of places in the area do and you've gone on to be recognized all over the country different high times events and in other uh award uh events and uh just recently last weekend you won again do you have an idea of how many you you're up to now and what did you win for th uh, this last weekend I'm up to a total of six awards. It would be four first place with high times, a second place, and a third place. And this last time, I won this last weekend with the Key Lime Ganja Pops, which was just a medicated push-up popsicle. Again, it was easy. And when we first came into actually designing oh, that, we were doing it for the children because we wanted to do a CBD edible. And when we first came out with it, we came out with about 29 milligrams of CBD and 4 milligrams of THCA, which was unactivated. So at that point in time, we had something around 30 milligrams, basically, of CBD with no psychoactivation of THC, which was great for kids. And we really thought about putting that into the CBD category, and we were taking a look at stuff, and we were learning... I'm also a believer, I understand the CBD part for the kids, but I also do understand for like myself, if I'm going to have CBD, which a lot of the stuff in there, I, I am one of those that need the actual THC added to it. So when we went back, we redesigned things and, you know, we made sure that we kind of had like a one-to-one -one ratio. And with the, such a hot weekend, it was just a, a very good treat. You know, it's all like...
Hey, Kirk, this ends our segment, man. We'll get you on before the uh, event, your event coming up in October. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, man. The Planet Green Trees Show. Join the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association today. MichiganMedicalMarijuana.org. The MMMA is focused on the well-being and safety of medical marijuana patients. The MMMA site provides the most comprehensive and up-to-date news on legal issues, politics, research, cultivation, as well as the various strange products and methods of cannabis use. Come join the discussion with the most knowledgeable and passionate advocates in Michigan today. MichiganMedicalMarijuana.org. Fantastic guest bloggers, incredible photography, and cutting-edge information separates the Compassion Chronicles from all other websites. Sign up for your newsletter today. Since 2012, the Compassion Chronicles has been delivering news and information for Michigan's patient community and beyond. From breaking news to science articles to networking and event information, Michigan turns to the Compassion Chronicles when patients and caregivers need to know the score. Edited by Rick Thompson, winner of the Crystal Trichrome Award for Journalist of the Year and named Citizen Activist of the Year 2015 by The Weed Blog. TheCompassionChronicles.com Attention, get ready to write down a very important number. Michael does not know how to fail. Second place is loser. If you have a medical marijuana case and need legal representation, call the best attorney, Michael Camorn. He's very passionate in the courtroom. Getting the best outcome requires quick legal action, and it needs to start with one call. Toll free to attorney Michael Camorn. 800-656-3557. Write it down. 800-656-3557. Michael Camorn gave us our life back. Attorney Michael Camorn. Vigorous criminal defense. Ram trucks are reaching new heights when it comes to capability and efficiency. The Ram Heavy Duty is the most capable full-size pickup on the road today. And the Ram 1500 is the most fuel-efficient full-size pickup ever. So what does that mean? It means Ram trucks are built for the long haul. Ram, America's longest-lasting pickups. Here's Michael Camorn with more Planet Green Trees. a voice that keeps on calling me down a road where I always seem to be and every stop I make I see my old friend and it ain't long till I get spun round and I'm gone again Maybe tomorrow my whole world will settle down But it ain't tomorrow, so I keep moving on I'm down a road that never seems to end Full of track lines and rails and lies around each bend if you're gonna join me for a while Better grab your hat, you know I live like that kind of hobo style Maybe tomorrow I'll wanna settle down It ain't tomorrow, so this old world's still my home I got my own world waiting to unfold In a Ziploc bag where I can drag out this worn down soul 
I made it through so far So I know it won't be long I must be almost there Already paid my fare with this hobo song And maybe tomorrow My God will help me settle down But it ain't tomorrow So I guess I'll keep moving on All right, we are back. Michael uh, should be <laughs> rejoining us in a minute. He's we're he has, back. Uh, stepped out, but uh, we did want to get it to a. He's a, not coming back. We did want to get to a subject tonight uh, and bring uh, Eric Gunnels back on to discuss a particular memo that's becoming uh, infamous now from who David we, Layton, who we thought was. Uh, Somebody fairly in support, or at least uh, hands off, or not that incredibly concerned, uh, and send it out to uh, dispensaries or to townships and cities. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, can you weigh in on that, Eric? Yeah, I sure can, Jamie. In fact, um, I uh, I received a letter in my mailbox right at my township uh, office that uh, you know, with the basically the press release and the, the full statement from David Layton's office. You know, and, and basically, you know, he's, you know, reverbing what, uh, you know, the attorney general has been trying to spout off about, you know, with the restriction to the caregivers uh, not being able to get transfer outside the five patients, uh, which, in my opinion, makes the act inoperable. If you take away the ability to have patients and caregivers interact with each other, uh, if a patient, you know, I mean, that would, that would come down to simply assisting a patient uh, who's not assigned uh, you know, rolling a joint for them or helping right. light their, you know, cannabis. I or what, mean, or what about a your crime? a township yeah. or a city just wanting to be more broad and liberal than, than state law and saying that, you know, we don't find an issue between transfers of, of people who are licensed, period, whether they're the directly connected five or not. This is how we want to try it out. And uh, right. I, why, why shouldn't home rule be considered or respected? I think it totally can be, Jamie, in this particular case, and I think any township or any city or municipality can do the same thing, especially when you uh, focus on law enforcement and what their agenda is, what you want to set as their agenda. A simple uh, resolution, uh, a written statement of a community's principles uh, and guidelines can be put forth, such as you know, a lowest law enforcement priority. And it doesn't have to be a ballot put forth in a city to where they gather signatures. It can simply be voted on by the elected officials of that community, whether that be a board of five members or seven members or however many, many members it is. It could be voted on, and by a quorum or a majority of that board, it could be passed and put into a law, or it can simply be put forth as a statement of the community's principles, meaning like, you know, look, it's, it's sending a clear message in a written statement to law enforcement Look, make this your law and law. Make this lowest law enforcement priority. Don't you know? You know, we we don't consider we you could you could we could word it where you say simply that we in this community declare that the interactions between patients and caregivers under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act are respect and valid and 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 so forth. I mean, a, an attorney could put that into better language than I could. But simply put, you a community can pass resolution to direct law enforcement not to pursue that. And, uh, and I, I think that's the direction to go. Eric, how, how was the uh, memo received by the rest of the um, people on the township uh, council? Well, each one of us would have received it individually in our mailbox. So each one of us would have taken it home with our packet and read it with our other material and given our own individual assessment on it. And we have not had a board meeting since each one of the board members has received this. So by, I would assume at the end of this month of September, when our official monthly meeting is, is when the subject will be put, either put on the agenda or, uh, or it may not be put on the agenda. It just may simply be, um, you know, that, you know, we, we don't, you know, and, and the MTA training, they also gave township advice uh, to say that, uh, you know, you can simply do nothing. You can choose to do nothing and just let the state, you know, cards fall as they may. Um, or you can, you know, try to, you know, rip it under some public safety issue thing. But then they kept pointing out that you can't trample on Trebek. 
the Tamik decision. So with respect to that, I think there is the majority of the communities will probably hold back from trying to cramp down on that, but that still leaves the, uh, the, the letter out there that's been received by everybody in the county from David Layton's office, and it seems uh, that at some point we're going to have to either challenge him on that or uh, I would like to create some open dialect about that. I think, I think once you read the statements given by the prosecutor, if, uh, if we go with the intent of the act itself of 2008, it goes against the act. It goes against the very principles that Michael was discussing earlier in his rant uh, this evening. Well, um, he, he so, has you know. seemingly piggybacked on uh, the recent People versus Bilsma. And uh, just to give a context to this, item A, it, it's really, it outlines um, A through E, the memo. Uh, item A is the only person that may lawfully deliver marijuana to an MMMA patient is that patient's registered caregiver. Uh, item B, a patient authorized to grow marijuana plants or a certified caregiver may not sell or give their overages, he puts in scare quotes, uh, any amount exceeding 2.5 ounces of marijuana or that amount that a patient is known to reasonably need to treat their medical condition seemingly leaving an opening for Adding Section 8 there, Section 8, yeah. um, but to a person not formally connected to them through the Michigan Medical Marijuana Program. Um, item C, there's no lawful business that can receive overages of marijuana for resale or delivery for donations to third parties just because that third person has an MMA card, i.e. no marijuana dispensaries. Any person delivering to persons not their registered patient or running a business that allows such deliveries is unlawfully delivering marijuana subject to prosecution under the Controlled Substance Act. Item D, a permit relating to zoning or the allowance of a marijuana business by a local municipality does not change any of the foregoing under state law as it currently exists. And item E, uh, if you are a landlord renting a building to an illegal marijuana dispensary, the rent received from this illegal dispensary may be subject to forfeiture owing to the fact that these are not lawful business enterprises. Scare tactic. He's made a lot of unequivocal statements as the prosecutor that reverse his previous hands-off position. That's very true, Chad. That's very true. And, that's, that, and when I received that letter and I first read it, I mean, it... it it did send a it did send a shockwave of scare into me. It, I'm not going to lie, but it but at the same time, Chad, I think we also have to look at the fact that the when the people voted for a law, how can one man, David Layton, or how can one department is his the he he is the overseer of the county prosecutional you know uh, you know jurisdiction? So how can one man in this department completely go against? what we all know to be the logical and plain English interpretations of the act. I mean, it, it just, I mean, with an overwhelming 63% majority of the voters, you know, voting for a law that changed something, and then our courts are going to undermine it and this and that, and our prosecutor is going to hand us some, you know, uh, fly-by-the-night interpretation. Uh, you know, I don't like, I don't like that. I, I, I disagree with it. I, I'm, I'm willing to stand, you know, up and, 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 and oppose the interpretation or I'm, I'm willing to oppose the enforcement of, of that or the prosecution of patients and caregivers under that, under, the, under that description. I think it's not right. It, it's, it's unjust. And I think that we are, we are going to have to come together as a community. And I don't mean just, you know, Genesee County. I mean, it, it's going to have, have, have to happen all across the state of Michigan. And we're going to have to stay up, stand up and fight this. In everybody's municipality, they're going to have to go to their township community board meetings. And any time that your community board meetings or board members try to pass something against this or try to, you know, block, you know, safe access in any way, it's time for the community to step up to those podiums and those microphones and speak the words that need to be spoken. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like the example of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, if a medical marijuana patient gets a medical marijuana license, how do they obtain that medicine? How do they get, you know, benefit from this, the act and the safety from the act if they can't legally acquire it from people? And if you're going to require their own caregiver to provide for them solely, then that takes, we all know that takes, you know, weeks, you know, months, if not longer. And there are going to be complications with that. So there needs to be a provision of safe access and that needs to be accepted through the act itself and, it, and the integrity of its intent. 
Well said, Eric. I don't think anyone would disagree with you. Absolutely not. No? I, no, no. I, I, no one would disagree oh, okay. <laughs> with such statements. No doubt right, of no, that. No, nobody in our, nobody in our, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody who fights for the true freedom right. of, of what we all agreed, and we all agree upon that the interpretation of the act meant when we voted for it in 2008. And we have. We, uh, we all thought the interpretations were throughout time, up to now. You know. We have, however, endured it in uh, Oakland County. It has occurred right. here. It's, it's occurred in other counties, Kent County, Livingston County. They're closing a lot of places up north, I understand, and doing very similar things. Well, they told us they were going to do this, yeah. and they said that this, uh, if we didn't get uh, some legislation passed in Lansing, that the raids were coming, and that's what we kept hearing over and over again. And it looks more and more like uh, they're starting to make good on their promise. But I think the good news is more and more we're hearing about uh, cases getting thrown out. And uh, I think that's the positive here. And, and we need to keep that momentum up because the more cases that we can get thrown out, uh, the less likely they are to pursue bullshit charges. Yeah, I agree with that 100%, Jim. And let me give you uh, an additional statement on that to kind of back up what you're saying. For example, um, I'm suing my own township police department uh, for violating my civil rights and my medical marijuana rights. And because I'm suing my police department, the, in our, our township's insurance company, who covers the uh, police department, they are now charging us higher rate to the tune that we've already that it's already cost us in the in the in the two two and a half years of my my lawsuit it's already cost my township forty five thousand dollars in addition to the normal cost to to fight this lawsuit that I'm bringing bringing upon them so in a way Jim what I'm what I'm trying to express here is that it is important like you said for everyone to fight this on any level you can. Because the more we fight it, the more we drag them into court, and the more we win, like I know I'll win my case, because I'm clearly in the right, and they're clearly in the wrong. And anytime you're clearly in the right, you need to fight it all the way, so that they know, so that the law enforcement knows how much money it costs them, it costs the community, to fight you, and to try to, and to, try to uh, show wrong with what you're doing, that they give up. They, they say, oh, it's not worth it. It's not worth the money. It's not worth the cost. And my police department is feeling that pressure right now because we're on a very tight budget, and $45,000 to my township is a big chunk of cheese. And that, that you know, that's almost like a, that's almost like an you know, entire salary. Uh, Eric, we're going to, we got a break, but uh, we'll uh, come back here in a moment. Michael's made his triumphant return into the Planet Green Tree studio. Hang on, everybody. We'll be back in a minute. Don't put that out. We'll be right back with more Planet Green Trees. If you, you missed the last Full Melt show... You missed a lot. Uh, th that's what's been going on. There's been some civil litigation uh, involving eviction. I'm trying to say I have a big, mean, vicious dog. <laughs> C-I-L, my landlord. Have you ever heard that sketch before? No, I, See, can't, I can't say I have. Here we go. Don't be lonely on the summer night. my landlord. I'm sorry. I'm upset, you know? I get lost. I'll get lost in a sea of verbiage. Do you want me to keep like a fly swatter on hand or something? Go ahead. I mean, just you give, went, me the, give me the went smack. You went off there for a minute. Man. Just give me the smack and I'll be like, right oh. On the, right on the back of the head. It's okay, guys. I'll keep them in line I'll, next time. I I'll, promise. I'll, I've seen things no man should bear. And those that every man should dare. From the beaches of Normandy to the far reaches of the earth. In my life, I have lived millions of lives. I've outrun robots and danced with dinosaurs. I've faced the faces of fear and fortitude and witnessed great beauty 
in the making. I've kept the company of kings and queens, but I'm no royalty or saint. I've traveled, trekked, wandered, and roamed, only to find myself right where I belong. Jeep. See your authorized Jeep retailer for details on how you can become a Jeep owner. Root Metrics, in the nation's largest independent study, tested wireless performance across the country. Verizon won big with 153 state wins. AT&T got 38, Sprint got 2, and T-Mobile got 0. Verizon also won first in the U.S. for data, call, speed, and reliability. AT&T got text. Stuck on an average network? Join Verizon, and we'll cover your cost to switch. Attention. Get ready to write down a very important number. Michael does not know how to fail. Second place is loser. If you have a medical marijuana case and need legal representation, call the best attorney, Michael Camorn. He's very passionate in the courtroom. Getting the best outcome requires quick legal action, and it needs to start with one call. Toll free to attorney Michael Camorn. 800-656-3557. Write it down. 800-656-3557. Michael Camorn gave us our life back. Attorney Michael Camorn. Vigorous criminal defense. Play-Doh Compound can help kids practice communication skills. Start by presenting the visual of the letter or word. Then ask them to mold the Play-Doh Compound into the shape of the letters. It's an effective way to foster speech and even writing. And now more Planet Green Dreams. All right, back on with Eric Gunnels on the line. I'm back, Eric. I, I don't know what you were saying before, and I'm going to try not to repeat any of the issues. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here, Michael. All right. Now, you were talking about the latent memo, right? I don't know how deep into that you got. Yeah, we were just talking. Yep. Someone update me real quick. What, how, how deep into it were we? Balls deep. I, I read it <laughs> on the air, the whole thing. All right. Points A through E. Did Jeff uh, Frazier have a chance to comment about it? We the discussed uh, the fact that it was some very uh, bold reversal of his previous hand-off policy, very unequivocal statements in opposition to what he had previously uh, stated. Even though it may not be specific, one could argue that the fact that he's the only prosecutor that's done that, am I right? He's the only person that's made a press release? He did it because there's a misconception of some kind that he has told others. No other prosecutors needed to do this, felt the need to do this. He needed to change his talking points. Well, it's, it's, Turn on his thing. It's the scorpion and the frog, right? They're, Go on. The scorpion and frog at the riverbank and the scorpion says, hey, frog, how about you swim me across the river to the other side? And the frog said, are you crazy, man? We get halfway across and you sting me and I'll die. The scorpion says, well, you know, why would I do that? Because then we both die. And so, all right, hop aboard. So sure enough, they get in the middle of the river and the scorpion stings the frog. And they're going down, they're drowning. And, and, uh, and the frog, you know, and the frog's like, "Why did you do that? You killed us both." And he said, well, "That's my nature." Because yeah. I'm Scorp- a scorpion. He's a prosecutor, man. What, you, what else do you need to know? Because I'm a prosecutor. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah, Some that's things the point. will never change. Gave him a lot of money back in uh, yeah. 2010. Maybe that was lots of money. Started. That may not have been the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He would have been much cooler yeah. than Bill Shooty. Still. Had, a, had a long run, though. Yeah. Well, I would say that... Uh, what the lesser of two evils looks like. Yeah. <laughs> there has been some... He piggybacked uh, on Bill's mind. Why, why is that? Why do you think? Just to give him an excuse to say something, really. Well, let's be honest. Hey, a anyone, reminder. Anyone that reads Balsma... Reminded? He never said it before. It's ridiculous. Never said it before, and of all the opinions to rely upon, 
it should not be a court of appeals opinion that was clearly is written with the intention of trying to undo Hartwig v. Tuttle and somehow putting a limitation on the Section 8 defense. And uh, these are not fair statements. Are they? Those well, are not fair statements. He, no. he puts here reasonably needed to treat their marijuana condition. Any amount exceeding 2.5 ounces or an amount that a patient is known to reasonably need. He's putting an allowance in here for Section 8 even. It's it's nonsense. Well, what and what he's done, he's created a, a crime that doesn't find itself in the books, which is a dispensary. A, a dispensary can be a place where caregivers gather to treat the five patients that they're connected to via the registry. He's also really, really, really calling out landlords, forfeiture, uh, local municipalities not being able to allow it. Not being able to allow it. Yeah. Does not being change any of the foregoing. Now. It's nothing about it is good. I would have to say this is, this is bad. He's suggesting that if your local community permits you to do the set above it, Activity it doesn't do in a zoning bad. thing that it doesn't mean anything. Right. Right. Thank you. We're still going to kick your door in. Thank you, local municipality governments. He's going with Fang instead of. Pat this McCombs is, this said that during the Thetford Township meeting. Right. He said it's not authoritative when locals have their own policy yeah. on it. But is, that there's prosecutorial discretion. For your kid. For my kid. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. But not for anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is um, really offensive. It's incredibly Especially, offensive. Especially, Jim, I'm sick and tired of you getting special treatment everywhere you go. Yeah, I know. You know yeah, so here it is, though. The only person no, it, that may deliver... No, no, what I'm saying is the idea that that's their answer, like the ridiculousness of the impact of what they're doing is like, well, you know, clearly you're right. It's a bad policy. Can't be reconciled with reasonableness but for one you know just we just call it as we see it we're That's, not going to be able to enforce it right it's like the uh what is obscenity you want me to define we, obscenity because he didn't even and, mention no, when that I see part it. Right? right like four years ago five years ago they couldn't even enforce other laws in the books because his well, office well, wasn't properly funded it's you know it, it's cop logic what they want to say is that the dispensaries are not strictly complying with state law, and therefore the feds can get involved. But <laughs> feds don't want to get involved. Oh, yes, they do. They're cops. Remember the uh, scorpion and the frog? Yeah. Thing? If they get invited in, they'll come, I assure you. Oh, yeah. You know, guys, I have a, um, I've been invited to uh, David Layton's uh, birthday party every year annually, uh, the September 14th. Uh, if you know, is there anything that I should be talking to him about while I'm there? <laughs> Jamie would like to be your date. <laughs> well, I, listen, let's not. You know, there's uh, been some. You know, as as uh, as the Godfather says, or not to, but I mean, this, this has been said. You know, politics makes strange bedfellows, and for some reason, we know that uh, Bill Shear has been spending some time in the Flint area. They've spent some time together. They coordinated on a couple of things. They were seen. I don't know, hugging, shaking hands, and coordinating. And it wouldn't surprise me if he said, you know, you got to shut it down, David, or something. I don't know. You know, there, there's, he's there. You know, we know Ken Stecker was hanging around there for a little bit. They, Fang is going crazy. Too bad someone could, have, could not have taken them out. Damn. Huh. Ang. <laughs> They're not called Ang. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Ang. It's not over. It's not over. We got to figure that out. How it, it's not over, but this is simply a reaction to something that you know Eric really started to spearhead, which is this objection to Fang coming into these municipalities and operating. And you know, sucks to be them that Flint decided to drop out. Good for them. Flint has way bigger issues to deal with than kicking in people's doors that are growing and selling medical marijuana. So I think David Lane would say it doesn't matter. I mean, of course he's going to say that. If he, he's if a, a prosecutor. Local, <laughs> no, no, no if, if, he's going to say I'm a scorpion. If, if the, he's saying that if there's a local They said they were going to keep enforcing enforcement. Right. Even yeah. in the cities that are Meaning not. Raid. Yeah. yeah. 
It, Even though they're not contributing, they're going to keep enforcing that. According to Judge uh, Heyman, I, the logic would be, you know, they can go wherever. Who? They, don't need, they don't need any approval. They're police officers. Who, Fang, Ang? I, I, I don't think so. When you, no? when you start defunding them by removing the participating municipalities. No, they're police officers. Their authority comes from their sworn oath as police officers. Yeah, but they're no, not going to work for the free. State. That's well, they're the not. The thing is, Flint is not going to contribute officers or funding or money. Yeah. But still, they said most of their enforcement activity is going to take place in Flint. Well, they said it in the newspaper article. Exactly. When, yeah, when we were, sorry, yeah. remember when we were in your Thetford meeting, uh, it was asked if there's an investigation and you decide not to fund them or, or contribute. <laughs> funding to them, are they going to stop at the border of Thetford Township or still continue to come in and do the investigation? They said they'll still probably come in and do the investigation. Yeah, yeah they did say that. Right, and they'll, they'll, they'll still kick your door open. And But the, and but my only argument is if they're going to kick your door open anyway, the last thing you'd want to do is pay them to do it. Right. Right? <laughs> right, that's ridiculous. So, I'm, I'm, I mean... I'm, I'm right. I'm, 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 I mean, if you're going to come kick my door open, fine. I'm just not going to pay yeah. you to come and do Eric's it. Eric's okay. Eric's okay as long as he's not paying to have his door kicked in. Other than that, he's good. <laughs> right. Sound like a true libertarian. <laughs> right? And then, and then, and then, and then I'm not paying for it. For it's later. private. It's okay. When Michael was out of the room... Uh, a minute ago, uh, I don't know if you heard me or not, but uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned on the air that my township at the last meeting had brought up the fact that my lawsuit had cost the township an additional forty-five thousand dollars in insurance premiums. Whoops. Right? Well, and so my point with that is, is that anytime anyone has an opportunity to sue for uh, law enforcement violating their civil rights or their medical marijuana rights, rights. They need to do that. They need to show the state and show law enforcement that we're not going to roll over and take that kind of crap and that we're going to stand up and fight for our rights when they are violated like that. And it will cost them to have to go to court. It will cost their municipality. And then people will be upset because they're, they're costing the system so much money. And so people will then say, hey, you're costing us too much money by doing that. Go do something else. Exactly. Right? Go, go, right. go hunt down some of these... You know, rapists and murderers that you haven't or, been able to or, track down. I mean, how about we focus right, on these, victims or, with or, or crime? All these, all these or, meth labs that don't exist. Right. You know well, I mean? of like, course. That's like, there's like 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 there's a huge epidemic in my in my community. Not really. I mean, it's just that they say there is. You know, Fang wants to say there is, so that they can get my community to pay money sure. for them to come in and really do nothing. Because it's it, except, rate, the, except for medical marijuana. People. They're capitalizing on the community's fear. I mean, that's all all there is to it. And people are afraid of meth really and the manufacture of meth. So that's that's what they're trying to exploit. Yeah, because I, I was there at the meeting. I asked my own chief of police, how many meth labs in the history of you being here have you ever seen? He said, zero. Right. Zero. Yeah. So it, it's not about it's not about that. It, it, it's a ruse. You know what I mean? It's it, in disguise to get money from the community yeah, right. and to perpetuate well, their job existence. You know what? That's I mean, listen, let, let's be honest. The idea of, of, of this entire concept is, is the premise that this war that needs to be waged and money needs to be gotten is a war that they acknowledge they're never going to end. It's like an endless cycle of just feeding. You know, like the, the, at the end of the day, like, give us money so we can do this. There's no end in sight. 90 it's like seconds. F- fund this war and the activities here and, and the carnage that goes along with it. Just keep doing it. Forget about the devastation. You know, we're not, we're not giving you a, a, an end date. We're not saying fund us until. It is, it's, you know, colonialization of humans. You know, of homes and people and their liberties. And taking them and you know, without any, you know, plan that they know it's just endless and, you know, it's, they can't, they can't win. I mean, seriously, it's like, it's, 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 if there's ever been putting bad money and, you know, good money on bad money, it's that from a legislative standpoint, Eric, talk to me. I guess the show's over. It's gotta be over. We can, we can come back. All right, we're not coming back. Eric, unfortunately, we're going to have to call it a wrap. You're out. We hope everyone has a wonderful evening from us to you. Stay safe and stay out of the path of Jamie Lowell.
10 seconds. The Planet Green Tree Show is produced in association with and made possible by the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association.